All right. For those of you who are just joining us, thank you so much for, for coming to the conference. It's great to see so many students engaged. We've had over 1400 registrations uh, from students representing over 60 different universities and from over 70 different countries. So um, thank you so much. Before we kick off, just a very quick point. Feel free to ask any uh, sort of questions throughout this session. Um, if you could include your name and perhaps where you're from, that would be wonderful. And um, we'll endeavour to answer those at the end. But without further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers. The, uh, so we've got uh, Emma Crichton, who is director of engineering at Engineers Without Borders. Hi Emma, how are you going? Good, thanks. Well, great to be here. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. We've also got uh, Helene Chartier, who is the who is the head of zero carbon development at C40 Cities. How are you doing? Fantastic. The, um, and we have got Dr. Mike Cook, former chairman of Bureau Happold, ISTRUCT gold medalist and uh, now keen environmentalist. How are you? Hi, uh, Will. I'm very, very well. Thank you. Delighted to be here. And I know um, Ellen and Emma are also uh, are keen to be here and to talk to so many students, enthusiastic ears that we would love to bend. Fantastic. Well, over to you guys. Uh, I've had a sneak peek. It, it looks to be a really uh, fascinating session. Thank you so much. Thanks. So hello, everyone. I'm going to kick off. Uh, as Will says, I'm a, I'm a structural engineer. I'm going to tell you a little about me and a, a lot about, about what, what, it, what interests me and concerns me. Um, and I'm going to charge straight in. Uh, this is how I, I see it. We want to talk to you about becoming and being globally responsible engineers in a, in a climate crisis, what it means and why and so on. And these images kind of summarise for me that we've got to find this, this place where people, increasing number of people in cities, um, in developing countries and well-developed countries um, have to live really sound, careful lives, but they need to look after the planet at the same time, which they rely on. And we need for this, this um, prosperity to be far and wide across across the globe, not just for a, for a precious few. So there's a lot to do uh, for we as engineers. And the three of us that are here now are um, going to split things up roughly equally. Um, I'm going to talk about the crisis we're in, the climate crisis, the drivers for change that will get us out of this, and the sorts of responses that you could possibly make. Um, Ellen is going to talk about mega cities and climate crisis because that's She's right in the middle of her, her job and the C40 Cities organisation that she's part of is central to this, making cities better places. And Emma Crichton of Engineers Without Borders is going to be talk about next the next decade of responsibility. So I think this is going to be really, really valuable to you as, as young engineers. So coming on to the crisis, the drivers, the response, a quick intro to, to me and, and I'm coming from Bureau Happold, a, a past chairman, a past director, um, and we do projects like this, which are effectively serving global prosperity as engineers. We're helping build buildings, build infrastructure to make places better for people. But um, uh, that prosperity is not equally shared across the world. Um, uh, and this is of some concern. Increasingly, as engineers, we're interested in finding ways of, of reaching more people and to doing it, doing this with more respect for, for nature. But we well recognise we need to serve global prosperity more equally. Uh, and that's something that all engineers do, need to think at and work at, on whatever firm, whatever size, whatever type of engineering. Where I fit in, well, there's a there's a group of people that I met, um, including Ted Happold, um, who is a Quaker. So it was quite interesting that Bill Baker, if you heard him, was talking about Quake, Quakerism as, as quite an important fundamental way of, of looking at things. And I think that helped me find a fundamental way of looking at engineering. So there I am as a, a long haired hippie. Um, but they introduced me to thinking about how we could 
uh, do more um, with with less, with less material, using um, uh, gravity models, using soap film models, and thinking about nature and how nature would would solve the problems that we were trying to solve. So I ended up with a PhD looking at inflatable structures and how underwater um, animals lived. And that came into the projects I've done, some of which you may have, may know, um, uh, like the, the British Museum, working generally with Foster and Partners as really architects who are so interested in engineering as well. Um, we came up with basically uh, listening to nature, thinking about nature and coming up with forms which are highly efficient uh, because of their shell, their ability to act as shells or their tensile forms, their saddle forms, which made them very efficient. So are quite modern, quite iconic structures sometimes, but always trying to find ways of, 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 of taking nature as our guide. And there I am as a, a less long haired hippie, rather more like the person you see in front of you now. And so that journey took me, if you like, thinking about the, the environment, thinking about how nature would solve problems. But I still hadn't woken up to the climate emergency that we're now in and that people are now waking up to rapidly until summer 2019. Um, long story as to how, how I got involved, but I became quickly involved two years ago, um, recognising the importance of this to engineers and started trying to encourage as many people as possible to get on board and to declare that there is indeed a, a climate and biodiversity emergency. And seeing the massive urbanisation that's happened, the massive growth of transport, the massive use of plastics, the creation of pollution and, and CO2 through um, uh, concrete const uh, or cement uh, manufacture and many, many other things, which has had this effect that, that I hadn't wasn't aware of until quite recently of of uh, changing the atmosphere and, and make, having a greenhouse impact. Um, this now means we have to change our attitudes as, as engineers. We have to worry about the fact that uh, um, uh, the ecological resources and services that we, we um, expect um, are being exhausted. Um, I'll leave you to look on, into what Earth, uh, Earth Overshoot Day is, but this year it was the 29th of July, so we've just passed it when we've overused our year's allowance of ecological ecological resources. Uh, we cannot go on like that. And this is a very unequal thing. Um, people that are prospering the most are creating the most carbon. They're causing the most harm to biodiversity, to nature and to the climate. Um, we, the prosperous, are doing the harm, uh, are creating the harm, but the greatest harm is done to those people without the defences, without the ability to build out of the problem. Uh, and that's worth highlighting because we, we, it, we, it's no good just saying it's OK for us. And the things that we're seeing happening already, hunger, uh, drought, floods, all parts of the world, um, homelessness that comes from that, the health and sanitation problems that haven't been solved, people on the streets, in poverty, people now looking for better places to live, including escaping from flood and climate change increasingly, and that as people move across boundaries, causing causing potential conflict. So this, the results of what seem perhaps like small ch changes in global temperatures are massive in terms of displacing people and the harm and the conflict they can create. Um, I, I like to think of this, I don't like to think of it, I, I think of this as a, as a breakdown in this equilibrium that we have been living with. Man and nature were in some kind of harmony, but this race for carbon, uh, carbon based fuel, coal, oil and so on, and then uh, the damage we do with our, our concrete uh, to nature, um, has, has, we're no longer really in, in equilibrium. So can this be restored? And there's a lot of action going on. The governments, governments are acting. We've got COP26 coming up in, in November and that's in the UK this year. But what can we do? And I want to just talk about three things that I think are particularly important for you. Um, first is understand, understand what's happening, take a view um, and then think about your response and then look at what influence you can exercise. So if we look at understand first, um, I'd like you to, to look at a, a book called Donut Economics by Kate, Kate Rayworth, if you're interested. And she talks about creating a safe and just space for humanity, it says at the top. And, and look at what that means. It's 
you need to be in the green zone on that diagram. That's the donut. Uh, you, that's where your safe and just space is, because if you go outside of that, you exceed the ecological ceiling, you start to harm uh, nature, ecology, you, you, go, you go out of equilibrium. If you go in the other side, into the middle of the donut, you start to fail to meet social requirements, social expectations. Um, people deserve better lives. We cannot stop development. There are too many billions of people with inadequate uh, facilities. Uh, so we do need to still do stuff. We still need to engineer. We've got an incredible job to do ahead of us as engineers, um, but we've got to keep in that space pace of balance. I want you to think about those things and, and start to understand them. And then I'm just quickly going to run through these. Understanding what is going to stimulate people to change and understand what are the things that are happening around us that will help change. Because you can, instead of thinking of yourself just as an engineer, you're part, part of a much bigger system and you can work with the whole system. So we've got, we're seeing, everyone is seeing, governments are seeing, the public is seeing health problems. They're seeing lack of security in their own homes with fires and floods. They're out on the street demanding change. Often it's about equality. And, and these are really important things that are going to stimulate change. So, so it's important because, because we can't, we can't uh, stimulate change alone. Um, and then all these drivers that we can grasp hold of that are, that are happening around us, technical opportunities um, that we can grab hold of, how to design better, more wisely, more carefully, uh, new ways of thinking about design into regenerative development, thinking hard about all of these different things when we design that will bring nature in, which will reduce the harm, which will choose materials more carefully and so on. Um, refer to the living building challenge um, and you'll find a lot of help there. Money is moving. It's moving away from the high risks that it sees with climate change. And, and this will mean people will not want to put money into the bad buildings that we've done in the past. And you will be helped in that respect. But look, look at that and look for where that money is. Um, and the other drivers like government are changing. They're declaring, they're declaring carbon zero targets. Um, nations and cities are doing all of this. Um, and this is really important, which is why I wanted C40 cities to, to speak to you. Cities are such an important part of our infrastructure, about the quality of life of so many people. It's important that they decarbonize and understand the issues. And education is changing too. I hope it is in where, where you're learning, but in the UK, um, uh, civil and structural engineers and highways engineers are all having their courses um, really refreshed and looked at. Um, driven by, by the institutions uh, and, and there's lots of scope there too. So do there's a lot to understand and a lot to get, get your teeth into, but this is your future and, and uh, I, I really urge you to do that. In terms of your response, less slides now, but uh, I can, I, I'm a structural engineer. I've, um, uh, I'm uh, very involved with the, the institution here in, in the UK. We have affiliations with institutions elsewhere, um, but you'll find free and available on their website, um, istructe.org, um, a lot of data now that we've put out there to help particularly structural engineers, uh, but construction people, um, and a guide to all the things that you need to to think about and that includes things like um, in calculating your body carbon the same way as everybody else and setting targets for your work uh, so there's 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 simple um, responses that you can make uh, every time so uh, but that's not enough decarbonizing design and so on isn't enough so you've got to get beyond the engineering if this graph is to say um, as we move to the right hand side uh, in time to 2040 and we have to bring down our CO2 emissions. Initially, in the next few years, we can do that with good engineering. Uh, we can work with with architects, with our clients and come up with good targets and cut out, cut down on the carbon. But eventually it gets really tough. And, and that's where along the bottom line it goes from the technical blue. We have to start to influence. We have to change. Um, how our clients think we have to change what the targets are for, for our projects and, and people like the finances and the investors are going to help us in that. So in terms of influencing where you are now, there you are as a, as a student, you know, if you want to provide, um, as it says in the Donut Economics, uh, a safe and just place for all, we're going to have to still be building. You're going to still be an engineer, but it's 
next bullet point is is you've got to do the right things. It's got to be done the right way in the right places and for the right reasons. You've always got to be asking why are we doing this and are we doing doing the right thing in the right way and in the right place? Um, so we need to work with all these drivers that I talked about, the social financial government, and we need to redefine what we value now, what we want for future generations. Um, Bill Baker was saying quite similar things uh, a lot of the time about values. You've got to think about what your values are. They're becoming really important. A couple of books there that I'd recommend strongly um, and a couple of videos you can find. There's links there, uh, but Bill Gates is saying some interesting things. Um, you know, he has a particular angle on it, but and and Mark Carney, ex Bank of England, very interesting and particularly about values. And so um, finally, I just say some things here that I thought were really important. So advocate for change um, where you are, uh, you know, speak out, um, demand in terms of your course outcomes that, that they're relevant to your values. Speak out as you can. Um, make climate emergency issues central to your approach um, and show to your department where you are at university that that matters. It matters to you and it will matter more and more in the future. And I know if I'm talking to engineering societies, um, you're the sorts of people who will speak out. So I'm relying on that. And so individually, and you'll hear from Emma particularly la later, uh, commit yourselves to be being globally responsible engineers at what is such an incredibly important and exciting time to be an engineer. So good luck with that. I'm now going to uh, move on to Ellen Cartier's um, slides for her, and I'm going to ask Ellen to, to speak instead of me. Ellen, hello. Hi, Ellen, if you might be able to unmute yourself, that would be perfect. Uh, sorry, sorry for that. Hello, uh, Ellen. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. And let me first say that I am um, myself an engineer. Uh, I, I hold a Master of Civil Engineering from the Ecole Centrale in, in France, and I'm really delighted to, to contribute to this, to this conference uh, because we know that the, the coming decade is, is quite essential for the survival of our environment, and it's really key that we collectively rethink our role as, uh, as engineer, asking ourselves how can engineer not only solve problems, but also better contribute to build a, a fairer and greener future and how we must adapt our practices and way of thinking in that in that sense. And I think what, what Mike just says is very uh, inspirational. Um, maybe uh, next slide, maybe a few words about uh, C40. So C40 is a, uh, yeah, next slide. C40 is a, is a network of uh, 100 world uh, mega cities that are taking action to addressing climate change. So our organization has been created more than 15 years ago and it's led by the cities themselves and it's really supporting all our, our cities to, to collaborate and to drive meaningful and measurable action on, on climate change. So uh, um, next slide, sorry. Uh, so climate change is becoming every day more and more real and we can see the terrible impacts all over the world and Let's be honest, over the past decade, the progress made to keep goal, uh, global heating below the 1.5 goal of the Paris Agreement has been very poor. And we know that the 2020s uh, will be the make or break uh, decade. It is now abs an absolute priority to act uh, and to cut emissions from the sectors that are more responsible for, for the climate crisis. And um, the, 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 the diagram that you can show here really I think we present well the, the current situation. The growth in renewable energy that you can see in, in green on the graph is way too slow to offset the, the growth in, in fossil uh, energy use. Next slide. So it is really time for radical change and the COVID crisis uh, sadly showed us that it is possible and we need a really similar radical approach to tackle the, the, the climate crisis. So climate action has to move from a peripheral issues to the central organizing principle of our, of our society. And for that, next slide please, I would like to, to take the example of the, of the Oslo climate budget, budget 
which is in that sense very imperational because it has really put the climate goals at the heart of all of the city's decision. So basically the city of Oslo is tracking and monitoring the GAG uh, emissions of all of their activities and projects with the same rigor and the same organization as they do with the, the money and, and, and finance. Next slide. Uh, all over the world, uh, we see more and more city government taking the lead of climate action, probably even more stronger than the, the national government do. And for example, all the 100 cities of, our, of the C14 network have already delivered their climate action plan, aligning their, their, their strategy with the Paris uh, Agreement uh, goals to halve their emissions by 2030 and to reach carbon neutrality by, by 2050. Next slide. Uh, we know that uh, there, there, there are three main sectors that are most uh, responsible for urban uh, emission. First is building for almost half of urban emission. And for this sector, the main objective is to ensure that every new building will be uh, net zero by 2030. The second uh, main uh, sector is transport and the objective is to create in every city the major zero emission area by 2030 and to procure only zero emission buses and, and public transport by 2025. And the third sector is waste. So the waste, the main objective is to divert at least 70% of waste from disposable or in incineration by 2030. Next slide. So these are uh, basically the, um, these are the, the basics. These are really the, the, the theory of the, the climate actions in, in, in cities. And, and as we see, these actions focus mostly on improving the technology and system to decarbonize building, transport system and waste management. But now let's try to think a little bit differently and to, to think how we could not only do better, but also reduce. And, uh, and I would like to, to, to give two uh, interesting examples. The first one, next slide please, is really about how we could decrease the need of mobility. So not only decarbonizing the mobility, but decreasing the need of mobility by reviving the quality of, of, of amenities in, in city neighborhood. And that's really the idea beyond the, the 15 minute city paradigm that you may have uh, heard, which is really about supporting thriving local life and decentralizing amenities and services. So in every neighbor, neighborhood, people can access everything they need within a short walk or bike ride from, from, from their home. It means transforming the organization of urban space to, into self-sufficient connected neighborhood. The concept is in direct contrast uh, to the urban planning paradigm that have dominated in the past center in the past decades, uh, which have seen specialization of uh, cities districts with residential areas separated from uh, business district, retail district, industry, entertainment, and all of that connected with, uh, with efficient uh, transport infrastructures that are mainly car oriented. And, and the lockdowns, uh, reboot working have, have, uh, with, the, with the COVID crisis have changed a little bit the way people work, move and shop. And in that sense, I've encouraged people to rediscover their, their local environment. It really created an appetite for a people-oriented city with complete neighborhood where residents can find most of what they need locally and can reduce their, their travel. And we see today all over the world cities uh, that are using these paradigms, this 15-minute city paradigm as a, as a good model for, for the COVID recovery as they realize that it can generate more responsive local growth viable local business and commerce and more vibrant neighborhoods and community, as well as more active travel and lower uh, emissions. So what is uh, what are the main uh, policies to implement this paradigm? Next slide, please. Um, yeah. So this is really about promoting mixed use zoning that allow diversity of use and, and residential types. It's really about uh, encouraging flexible uses of building in public space and create a uh, third space that can serve multi-purpose. It's been also about uh, supporting essential neighborhood retail through uh, economic development pro program, encouraging teleworking and co-working space as well as digitalization of services and facilities to reduce uh, commuter travel, 
making walking and cycling the mode of choice and repurposing some street and parking spaces to improve, to improve uh, active travel as well as to develop new uses for community building and bringing uh, public space. So that's really very uh, a quick overview of this, uh, of this paradigm. Uh, next slide. So in the same idea, in the same uh, vein, uh, the, I think it's also interesting about not only decarbonizing the, the built environment, but try also to building uh, to build less. And that's really a, a change of uh, state of mind. Uh, as a reminder, as a reminder, sorry, uh, buildings that generate uh, nearly 40% of global uh, GIG and in cities it can go until uh, to, to 50 to 60 is even uh, a percent of, uh, of the emission and approximately 30 percent uh, come from operation of building and 10 percent from from the construction of the building itself and the estimation says that one billion new homes will be built by 2050. This corresponds to build a new city the size as uh, of New York per month until 2050. So and I think it's a very important uh, number uh, because I think no matter how we build, how decarbonize we can um, the built environment, uh, we, have, we have to ask ourselves if our planet uh, can sustain all of this uh, new construction and probably not. Uh, so I think the first question we should therefore ask ourselves is how we could build less. And for that, it is important to explore alternative approaches to demolition and prioritize uh, reuse and refurbishment to, to new construction. So next slide. And for that, there is a, an important thing uh, I think that we must do that cities start to do is to monitor the, the vacancy rate of their buildings to, to really consider the real need for new construction and to develop holistic strategy to make the most of the existing stock of building instead of building more and more. And this means developing policies to limit building vacancy, and there is a, a different cause to, to building vacancy. But this means also repurposing uh, building and develop more adaptable uh, uh, building uh, methodology. Next slide. For that, I think it is it is interesting to it is important to fight the specialization of buildings that has really intensified in the past uh, 50 years. And I just would like to, to show this example from from where I live in Paris uh, that compare the traditional Haussmann building that are uh, very easy to transform actually because their structural grid, their ceiling height allow really easy repurposing. And in contrast, the more recent building, and especially offices building, have become more and more uh, specialized in their aesthetic and as well in their structure and therefore are very difficult to, to transform. And I think there is a lot of questions these days about the avenir of this type of building with the uh, development of uh, remote working. So we need to make the most of uh, existing building to reduce the need of, of construction. And for that, next slide, we must consider maybe two main types of uh, adaptable, flexible building. Uh, the first thing is really to be more flexible on the daily, weekly basis to allow several uses over the day, over the week in the same building. And next slide. We must also think about how building can be reversible in the long term, how to allow change over, uh, of use over the time. So how, for example, an offices building can become the housing of, of tomorrow because a lot of, uh, of building are actually demolished because they need to change the, their, their use. So that's really just a few ideas that I'm, I, would, I wanted to share with you about how we could reduce the need of, uh, of building. Uh, next slide. And the last point I wanted to, 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 to mention, uh, to highlight the, the, the need to change the way we see at SYNC is really about the way we calculate the carbon footprint and especially the carbon footprint of cities, of nations. As I indicated in the beginning of my presentation, many cities are act actively working to reduce their emission, uh, the emission emitted on their territory. Some cities like uh, Copenhagen or Paris, London, uh, even on the road to carbon neutrality, which is really uh, encouraging. But there is a form of misrepresentation here, because in reality, if we take into account all the emissions, including those, those emitted locally, 
but also those coming from the goods consumed by the residents, the carbon footprint of the cities, even the most virtuous ones, are far from, from improving. A recent, studies, uh, a recent study led by C40, Europe, and the University of Lille even showed that if we include consumption goods, the carbon footprint of a city like London increases by around 60%. It, it is estimated that uh, in major Western metropolises, if no action is taken, emission from the consumption will double, will double over the next decade, while we must reduce them from uh, by two thirds. And next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and um, 85 percent of of these consumption based emissions are emitted outside the territory. But, and it is so I think it's very important to consider that and to really take into account in the calculation of, of the of the carbon footprint of our nation, of our city, these consumption based emission, which mean discussing lifestyle, discussing consumption with our citizen. And next slide, please. For the anecdote, I would like to remind the sentence that the President Bush pronounced in, at the UN Earth Summit in 1982. He said, the American way of life is not up to negotiation, period. I think this sentence really led to the failure of the first global negotiation on climate. And less than 100 days before the COP26, I thought it important to remind ourselves this sentence because I truly believe that we won't solve the climate crisis without a profound transformation in our way of doing, our way of living, our way of consuming. And I think this is something that engineers, we must better integrate in our creative thinking and, and work. And just to end my presentation, next slide, please. I just would like to mention very quickly an initiative that, uh, that C40 is organizing. It's called Student Remounting Cities. And it's aimed to create a space for students and academics to collaborate with city governments to deliver new approach for low carbon urbanization. We have run a first uh, edition of this initiative uh, this year with 18 cities that have joined uh, C40 for this first edition and more than 1000 students that uh, propose fresh ideas and solutions to decarbonize uh, urban areas and, and improve the quality of life for, for local uh, community. I stop here, probably too much already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much in, indeed, Ellen. Uh, really good. And um, I, I must say that it's hard to emphasize how important the behavior of cities and the approach to climate change that is shown by cities really is. I think it can be much stronger than national governments in in terms of really changing the lifestyles of people and changing policies locally that can have real impact. Um, and I just wanted to underline that for, for, for students because I know I've for a long time thought governments were the powerful body, but uh, as more and more people live in more and more complex uh, uh, cities, um, and we're reliant on them, it turns out that they actually have a lot of power. And we're seeing in the UK, it's probably the city mayors that are making the most important changes to how we develop. And I think students here who are working for in the built environment side of engineering will find cities are an incredibly important place for them and future clients for them. So they've got to be able to respond to what cities want. So thank you, Ellen. Um, I, I, Emma, um, you're with us now. Um, uh, Engineers Without Borders is a fantastic organisation. You're going to tell us uh, what what you're doing and and what you think about you know the next decade of responsibility looks like. I think you're going to take over the the slide share now. Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, I am. My computer's just being a little bit slow, so I'm going to talk whilst trying to transfer the slides up just now. Um, but just to say hello, I'm Emma. So I work at Engineers That Borders UK. I'm head of engineering. Um, my background is in civil engineering. I'm a chartered civil engineer. I graduated in 2012 um, and have always been passionate about people. Um, I didn't go into engineering because I was interested in the, the kind of concrete or buildings or materials. I was interested in the, the way that engineering serves society, the way that engineering impacts our day to day life. 
um, and the way that it can be very useful to society at a scale and a kind of foundational level that really shapes so many people's lives, whether it's the water we drink, the energy that we use, uh, the cities that we live in, or the way that engineering can obviously have a negative impact as well on our, our ecological systems. Um, so I'm just going to try and share my slides. One second. Sorry, it's just, it's just it is thinking a little bit. It is. Yes, okay. we've got your front slide. Engineering the next decade responsibly. Am I correct? No, that's that's my that's slide. Mike's. OK. Um, sorry. It's just being a little slow. Um, so. Um, let me just try for one second and then I'll do it without slides. OK, the team is a bit slow, so I'm just going to continue on because it's more important that I'm here today to talk to you than you get to see the visuals. Um, hopefully Will can share some uh, of the PDFs just so you can kind of see some visual aids as well. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm from Engineers That Borders UK. Engineers That Borders UK is one of over 60, six zero Engineers That Borders organisations from around the world. Um, there is an umbrella organisation called Engineers That Borders International. And what we do um, is, is a bit different to other international borders organisations. We have a fo core focus on education, but that is shared by a number of our sister and, and cousin organisations. So we meet, we collaborate, we work with many other engineers that borders organisations around the world, including in South Africa, engineers that borders Australia, Brazil, India, Somalia. Philippines, Netherlands, and then equivalent organisations like Research and Development Without Borders Cameroon, um, Engineering Change Lab Canada, um, and Engineers Without Borders International. So I just wanted to say that yes, today here I'm talking to you about Engineers Without Borders UK, um, but I would hope that you're also inspired to look up your local Engineers Without Borders organisation as well. Mike, can I just check that uh, you can still hear me? Yes. Yeah, because it's I've lost you now as well on my screen. Um, so <laughs> at Engineers at Borders UK, we have a vision where society balances the needs of all people with the needs of our planet. Um, and we have a mission to put global responsibility at the heart of engineering. What that means is we're trying to work to the point where there is a tip in engineering, where there's a cultural tip towards being more globally responsible. And by 2030, we aim to have over half a million people involved in the movement, powerful enough to radically transform the culture of engineering. And I think what we've been hearing today is the need. We've been hearing a lot around, you know, governments and policymakers and what cities are trying to do and what needs to be done in terms of trying to address our ecological crises, um, but also make sure we meet the needs of all people. And there is this huge crisis in terms of our climate and biodiversity emergency and growing inequality. But today I want to talk about how we can try and address them, some of those things, how we can meet the needs, um, but also how we can meet, you know, ideas or policy that's coming through or government targets. And I think creativity is a key part of that. How can we respond to these things? How can we do things differently from the past? And what is the role of education and learning and reflecting um, as a kind of key part of that? So what we know is that millions of people still don't have their basic human rights met, such as access to reliable energy or water or somewhere safe to live. And typically, Engineering still largely relies on an unsustainable practice and materials with a limited consideration of its broader impact. Engineering and the engineering community has played a significant role, both good and bad, in getting humankind and the planet to where we are today. But it also has the power to radically transform our world for the better, to offer credible solutions, to reduce emissions and to take drastic collaborative action required now to ensure a safe and just future for all. 
as mentioned before, you know, this is the make or break decade or the decade of action um, towards meeting the sustainable development goals. And for anybody that doesn't know in the call, they are a collection of 17 global goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. The sustainable development goals were set in 2015 by the United Nations General Assembly and intended to be um, met by the year 2030. And I'd like to pose you a quick question. Knowing this, knowing the need, hearing what we've heard today, and I'm sorry that this is a UK specific um, stat, but it's interesting to hear a kind of global response to this, is what in the UK, what percentage of engineering employers think that their workforce has the skills to implement a sustainability strategy? So have a think, what percentage of engineering employers in the UK think their workforce has the skills to implement a sustainability strategy? So if you can pop any thoughts that you have into the chat, um, into the q and I'll give you just a minute to ponder that. What percentage do you think that might be? Emma, while, while pausing, sorry to interrupt you, but um, I've, yep. I've stopped sharing. Is it worth you just double checking whether there's anything at your end you can yep. pick up to start sharing? While, while everyone's thinking about your question. Fantastic, thanks. Okay. It's frozen, Mike, actually, so yeah, we'll just leave it there. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so what the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the IET, found this February in 2021 was that only 7% of UK engineering companies with a sustainability strategy feel they have the skills to fulfil it. 7% and when you when you think about that I don't know how you feel but for me I feel that that's quite scary the fact that only 7% think that they have the skills to meet a sustainability strategy and that's those that have a sustainability strategy as well so there's a need for influencing in terms of understanding how we come together and set these strategies and goals and targets. But also there's a key piece around making sure we have the skills, the culture, the ability to then meet those targets, to meet those sustainability strategies. Um, so what we believe at Engineers at Borders UK is that a diverse group of people brought together by a common goal is key to driving change and accelerating our ability to equip ourselves with the skills needed um, in this decade. By becoming a, a member of Engineers at Borders UK, you would be demonstrating professional commitment to globally responsible engineering. The people that we have involved in our, in our movement are passionate. They, come, they form from school students all the way to, through to company leaders as well. Engineers at Borders UK was formed in 2004 by students at Cambridge University. It was students that created this organisation and charity um, and that drive was really came from the fact that they weren't seeing this inside their, their degree courses, thinking about people and planet and how, you know, the technical dimension of solutions feeds into a wider, broader impact. So what we need to see is more listening and challenging and collaborating with others to really learn how we can actually meet the needs um, of today and tomorrow. And very much seeing that collection, the ability to come together um, to accelerate learning in this space. Our focus um, is on reaching the tipping point where global responsibility becomes integral to the way engineering is taught and practiced. That as you go through your university degree, these things are a cultural feature. I don't know what it's like for you at the moment with your degree course, um, whether you're learning about the wider, broader implications of the work that you could do in your career, understanding how your work will address the climate emergency, understanding you know, how to produce equitable and sustainable solutions. I hope that that is a cultural feature in your degree course. But if it's not, I hope that you're questioning that. Like Mai said, advocating and, and kind of calling that out, but also looking for ways to upskill yourself in this and looking to evolve those skills as you go into the profession as well. At Engineers at Borders UK, we want to inspire a lifelong, meaningful commitment to globally responsible engineering, and we're not the only ones. So by a being able to kind of work with others and to drive change collaboratively, we're looking to um, 
for globally responsible engineering or kind of responsibility and thinking about you know what is the responsibility of this but also making sure that we act responsibly becomes a kind of mainstream concept and it's not just about inspiring individuals it's also about companies who can help transform the culture of their organization to be able to meet things like their own sustainability strategy or wider initiatives but today i wanted to quickly touch on upskill which is our third strategic goal of our new strategy um, which talks about equipping the engineering community with the skills and expertise to be globally responsible. By 2030, we want to upskill at least 250,000 people to deliver globally responsible engineering and do this through influencing competency frameworks and professional development at every stage that a person might need it, but also at university through design challenges and project based learning courses. I hope that you've had design projects in your courses that have allowed you the freedom to lead your own learning, to identify problems as well as trying to solve them, because that kind of core skill really makes up um, a kind of understanding of the things that we've heard today around, you know, challenging the status quo, not building the thing that's most sustainable, not doing that, a kind of understanding the social and environmental landscape in which the solutions that you will develop in the future operate in. And today's conference was is, is entitled Pioneers Engineering the Next Decade. And I hope that it's not too cheeky to say, but I think there's a word missing from that title. I think responsible needs to be added in or responsibly. So engineering responsibly in the next decade or engineering the next decade responsibly because I think it's key to be critical thinkers and challengers of the status quo. What we've seen and heard today kind of reflects the need for that, to be systems thinkers and understanding and navigating the broader impact of the work that you could do. Yes, innovation, entrepreneurial endeavors, creativity, new and existing approaches, digital transformation is key in our ever-changing world. But the dynamism of that ever-changing world requires us to continue to reflect on what is the role of engineering, what are the things that we need to be doing and how to do it, not just focusing on our technical skills, which are a key dimension, but it's more how you can use them and act with them responsibly. So today I hope you are inspired to think and, and understand more about your ethical implications of the decisions you might make in the future potentially broadening out who you learn from, whether it's your degree course, but also online, kind of understanding what that, that wider expertise you might need to inform the decisions in the future. Doing something equitably is really difficult. Um, so kind of understanding, yes, there's, there's key things we need to do around addressing the climate emergency, but how do we solve our planetary challenges whilst being equitable is really where we want to operate. That's Mike's donut that we heard about earlier. And our belief is that engineering has the ability to do so and the people with engineering have the ability to understand that and really grapple with that. Um, so I hope that you, you're inspired to kind of think about the planets more, the people there, but it's not people or planet. This is a false choice. It's very much looking at how do we, how do, we do something sustainably and equitably. So finally today, um, I wanted to, to provide you with a little bit more detail as to how you might do that. To act responsibly, we have some key principles. So the first one um, might not be a surprise, but is responsible. So to meet the needs of everyone within the limits of our planet, this should be at the heart of engineering. The second one is very much around that determination and being intentional about what you're doing. So that second principle is purposeful, to consider all the impacts of engineering from a product or project's inception to the end of life at a global and local scale for people and planet. The third principle is inclusive, to ensure that diverse viewpoints and knowledge are included and respected in the engineering process. That might sound quite abstract, but it can be quite common where actually there's a very limited group of people who are informing the decisions that are made on projects. Being inclusive allows us to really understand and have people participate actively in the solutions that will impact them and others in their communities. And finally, regenerative to actively restore and regenerate ecological systems rather than just reducing impact. If you're interested in finding out more about these principles, about being connected to an amazing group of 
you know, engineers, students, entrepreneurs, company leaders who share this value around social and environmental justice, then please do consider joining the Engineers Without Borders movement. We exchange ideas, we keep each other inspired and access support and resources, including motivational talks, training courses and in curriculum design challenges. Um, members are empowered to advocate for change in their workplace or in their university um, as well, and really to embed that global responsible approach, which is not easy to do alone. So it's very much about providing a, a supportive framework um, and a group of people to support us in that journey. Um, so I'll post a, um, a link in the chat if I'm able to, but um, if you would like to find out more, it's www.ewb-uk.org uh, yeah, forward slash join. Um, and I'm really excited yeah, to continue the discussion today. Thank you for having us. Brilliant. Thank you Emma, so much. Um, yeah, and it was really nice actually to see the person speaking um, face to face <laughs> uh, because this is something that you say from the heart. So, um, it, we, you know, maybe we didn't miss the slides too much and I'm sure everyone's going to go on, go online. And I think Will is going to put the link on chat. So, um, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, really your your summary of four points um, is 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 critical. I was just going to end with something I've been thinking about, just one slide really, this one, you know, if you like, what is our cause? And I think we've talked about young, the young people on the, uh, um, on, the on this call, um, talk, thinking about their values think, and thinking about their future and thinking maybe about what does it mean to be a pioneer and to be responsible? Um, and I, I, it seems to me that there's a lot here that's about these five things that I've written out in this slide, ethical commitment um, to ensure that we that we as individuals do no harm. This is what doctors um, have a Hippocratic oath for, that we as engineers do no harm, but in fact only do good. Um, to make sure that we as engineers have got the skills to do that good and to understand um, you know, how to get uh, those sorts of outcomes. Um, that we actually understand, we appreciate um, how our actions impact on people and the planet, um, that they're not just something we do for a client, there's something that have wide actions across, across uh, the globe. Um, that we ensure th as professionals that we have, have an authority to act in the best interests of society. We can't do it hiding behind a, a stone. Um, we've got to make sure that governments um, and clients give us the authority to do what's right. Um, and of course, as individuals, I think we need to have courage to speak out and influence what, what, what society asks. Sometimes we're not always being asked to do the right things and we have to have courage to speak out. And so, you know, I just wanted to kind of underline what you, what you were saying there, Emma, and this is something that I've been thinking about. In fact, I think I, I worked on this uh, while I was listening to another of your important um, <laughs> uh, uh, conferences that you held recently. So this is the cause uh, for me of, of globally responsible engineering, um, and I hope it, it resonates with others. And now I think Will may have um, a, a few questions that have come in while we've been talking. Is that right, Will? You're on mute, not well. The, uh, that's right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. The, uh, we've had a few questions come in and also some that were submitted beforehand. Um, I think one of the big questions that is being asked, do we need to sort of change in our mind the definition of what being an engineer is? It's, it's not building things, it's building them responsibly and it's how they interact with the built environment. I'm uh, keen to hear, hear perhaps one or two people's mm -hmm. thoughts on that. I'm happy for anyone to. Yes, we we do. I mean, I, I think we've we've got it wrong. I mean, I think particularly we're educated. In, I was educated certainly in a, in the wrong way. As somehow engineers um, were kind of people who who worked in in a very blinkered area, um, solving a problem without any 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 thought as to whether it's the right problem um, and whether the solution would be right for the context and so on is it's so much more more important and complicated and we have to think about the systems that we work in um i, th I think it was emma that brought out that that idea engineers should be trained to be really good at looking beyond the technical engineering at the wider systems so there's a lot of there's a lot of scope for uh, for getting better fantastic yeah another question uh this is 
sort of more directed at uh, Elan. Uh, so COVID, it's been a real opportunity and a turning point for many cities to take the, the opportunity to take a look at how they're being sustainable and their use of infrastructure. Do you think that cities are doing that enough? Do you see what in their response to COVID? Keen to hear your, your thoughts on this. Hmm. It's, a, it's a large question. Um, I think they are, they are doing, of course, not enough, but I think there is an acceleration since five, ten years. And I think Mike said, I think it, it, if you compare to nation, for example, they have definitely take the lead on, on action. They have more operational um, capacities to, to deliver concrete and tangible solution on the ground. And I think they are we are trying, and I think the, the COVID, and I try to, to show that with a few examples on um, with a 15 minute city approach and other, I think COVID has changed a little bit the way people are thinking. And I think I, I tried in my presentation to show that just to see a little bit how we can see a little bit differently. We were always thinking about, you know, doing more, doing better. And I think the, 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 the sort of stop that happened here has a little bit changed uh, the way of thinking of people and of, of cities, and I think it delivers interesting uh, solution, not necessarily through technology, and uh, but also about uh, uh, changing uh, changing the way we see at things on, on mobility, on building, on food, on on the way we consume, which I think deliver concrete uh, action, and I think change a little bit the way city want to, to drive a little bit their their, their climate strategy. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Maybe one last quick question, or maybe uh, a few words from Emma or Mike. If there was one key takeaway for the students from this session, what, what would it be? Emma? I think it's the, I think it's the, you know, our role is to, to create solutions um, that help provide people's desires and needs responsibly. Um, so kind of like framing it as around like that definition. Um, and then a second point I think is we don't talk about this enough is that this is creative and fun and interesting. This is the thing that could make engineering a really kind of creative environment. Um, I, I get scared when I walk, walk into quiet design offices um, that frankly they're a bit dull um, but also like you're not having that collaborative, you're not having those conversations, you're not challenging each other, you're not really kind of going for it. So I think if you can take another thing away is it's not all doom and gloom like this is something that you know allows us to step into to I guess the fun side of engineering as well which is you know making sure it's about people and dynamic situations and not just filling in spreadsheets and um you know the technical skill sets like i think it's it is you know often looked as this is something we have to do but also i think this is something that is, is hugely creative and and such an opportunity fantastic and can i just will say yeah <laughs> you try stopping me um i i, I think you know engineers uh, I, I think there's a great opportunity for engineers to, uh, I think it was Bill who said earlier um, speaking uh, that, we, you know, we need to we need to be prepared to take a position. We cannot shy away from the fact that we have very important knowledge and very important way of seeing the world which people need. We must use it really wisely and and that is where responsibility comes in. You cannot be a a professional in this in the world of engineering and not recognize that really big responsibility we have and and in the current situation uh, with climate change in, in particular but social inequity that, that is still perpetuated there's so much more for us to do with that capability than just um, the the simple problems that are put to us we have to go bigger wider and take the blinkers off read those books become a globally responsible engineer, sign up to Engineers Without Borders, look into what C40 Cities is all about. It's a fantastically fascinating world out there. Don't just listen to your lectures. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a really inspirational session and uh, I'm certainly coming away uh, thinking that uh, I need to do things differently and um, reevaluate reevaluate what, what I'm being taught, what I'm learning, how how I'm working. And I certainly hope that 
everyone else is, is feeling similarly inspired. Um, big thank you to all of our speakers for taking time out to speak with us. It was really wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Helen. And um, we've got uh, another session coming up just now, slightly different theme, um, redefining startup success with Ellen Sue, who's chief product officer at Wellinks and a former successful engineering startup CEO. Um, but we've also got a networking area, which uh, you are most welcome to head to, or uh, also please do check out the other sessions that are happening um, on our conference program page. Um, I've just popped those into the announcements area. Um, but thank you so much for joining us and uh, once again, big thanks to our speakers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone. It's been good, good to be here.